Okay, go ahead. All right. Hello, I'm so honored to moderate this panel today. We've been so focused on the other gene-based breakthroughs, namely, namely the coronavirus vaccine, that I feel this other revolution hasn't received much attention. And yet when we think about celebrating scientific achievements, this is about as big as you can get. As of last month, the FDA had approved two gene therapy products. And as of last year, there were 900 investigational new drug applications in this space. Researchers are pushing the boundaries of how we manipulate the expression of genes for therapeutic use. And they're offering real hope for the estimated 300 million people worldwide who suffer from an identified 7,000 rare conditions. And these are the ones we know about. That includes 5% of babies worldwide who will be born with a rare disease and 30% who won't live past their fifth birthday. So frankly, the stakes couldn't be higher. Fortunately, we have the opportunity to talk to the change makers who are working to get more therapies to more people. I'm delighted to have on our panel today, Suku Nagendran, who was chief medical officer at Avexis from 2015 to 2018 before the company was bought by Novartis. Of course, that company made headlines when its gene therapy for young children with spinal muscular atrophy was approved by the FDA in 2019. He's now president of R&D of Jaguar Gene Therapies in Chicago. Casey Wollobin, the mother of a child with a rare disease who also helps other parents advocate for their children and get research attention. Laura Sepp Lorenzino, chief scientific officer at Intelia Therapeutics who has the unique perspective of several decades experience in academia and industry, and who can give us the big picture perspective on drug discovery. And of course, RA Session II, who's CEO and founder of Tasha Gene Therapies, a wave-making Dallas-based biotech that launched 101 million IPO last year and has an impressive 25 gene therapies in its pipeline. In this panel, we'll address everything from the commercial challenges and ethical implications to the high stakes these therapies hold for people who are suffering and the people who love them. But first I wanna talk about, how did we get here? And this one's for you, Laura. Why is this such a golden age of gene therapies right now? What things had to happen to make it possible? Was there a perfect confluence in the development of the science, commercial opportunities and FDA openness? I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> no, this, this is great. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Um, this is really the confluence of the revolution in molecular biology. And, you know, many years by many different disciplines, uh, finding solutions that had been applied. And now that gives us the opportunity to understand the disease at the molecular level, not just in a person, but at the population level understanding how to manipulate those genes, uh, you know, what are the causative um, uh, changes for disease, and then how to manipulate them to, uh, to bring them back to health. Um, delivery is another uh, big, um, you know, contributor to the success. And the identification of adeno-associated viruses as a non-pathogenic uh, virus that has the capacity of yeah, transducing multiple different cell types in the body has opened the opportunity of now directing these gene therapies to different organs and being able to address uh, multiple different pathologies. Um, the work that you know my colleagues here have done with Avexis and Gelsma demonstrating that uh, a gene therapy can lead to a curative uh, therapy for patients with SMA was transformational. And uh, this ability to understand the genetic change, introducing it in a safe and effective manner and really changing the life of uh, children and their parents. Uh, awesome. and, you know, the excitement about around Tasha and other companies is now the ability to take a platform approach, really think through with all the tools that we have validated in the clinic, how can we use them to have a robust pipeline of differentiated uh, candidates that are going to be appropriately uh, delivered to the patients in need? So uh, nice. perfect timing. Great, thank you. This is for you, Suku. So this is a good opportunity, opportunity to tell us a bit about how gene therapies work. Why was your therapy for spinal muscular atrophy such a big deal? 
I'd love to hear, you know, how it works and of course how it changes the lives of patients. Yeah, thank you for that question, Sarah, because uh, in gene therapy, as uh, Laura was pointing out, the evolution over the last three decades have been significant. And what we've discovered is that the, one of the most important things we have to understand is are these monogenic disorders, meaning a single gene issue with the disease state, or does it involve more than one gene? The second point that is important is in a disease like spinal muscular atrophy, especially type one, it's a rapidly progressive disease, meaning by 20 months of age, 95% of these children either do not survive or they are on permanent ventilation. So essentially, when we intervened with the gene therapy, what we discovered is that the gene therapy, which was a monogenic disease-based gene therapy, had very rapid impact on the disease process and showed the external world, including the patients and their parents, that its impact was transformative. As Laura also pointed out, being able to understand the delivery method, i.e. the vector here, in case it was AV9, which where I think we have the most experience now globally when it comes to gene therapy delivery, was also reassuring to us that it could give us the greatest penetration into the central nervous system. So what I'm getting at collectively is with uh, Avexis and with spinal muscular atrophy, what we showed was for a monogenic disorder using the correct vector AV9 and the correct route of administration, where in this case it was intravenous systemic, with a rapidly progressive disease, your impact clinically could be transformative. And what I would also point out is this is what uh, is very interesting with what Taisha is trying to do, given that they are using an approach which is intrathecal, which I think is well studied and, uh, and understood for many central nervous system-based disorders where the biodistribution of the, of the genetic material appears to be significant, where I think the clinical translation based on their preclinical work could be very effective in the human as well. So again, uh, we are very excited about the world of gene therapy and how it's evolving. And I would say one more thing. I think the, the learnings that we get from all these different companies and Taisha included may eventually allow us to go beyond single gene disorders. And I would nice. add that diabetes, for example, is a disease that eventually maybe we could treat with gene therapy someday. Nice. Um, how many kids have gotten to take um... Zolgensima, is that the name of the gene therapy? Zolgensima. So, Zolgensima. Yeah, so I would assume now globally, given that it's approved in the US, Japan, and Europe, uh, I would say thousands of patients have received Zolgensima using the intravenous route. And also the intrathecal route has been studied now for patients with spinal muscular atrophy uh, at birth. So with newborn screening, you can treat pre-symptomatic children and uh, the clinical impact could be tremendous. So I don't want to use the word here, you know, with, uh, in, in a clinical context, but I would say gene therapy used early on in any disease process has the potential to completely transform the disease path in patients. So I'm very optimistic that as, uh, you know, uh, uh, Taisha develops its programs and other companies, including some of the companies we are involved in develop our gene therapy programs, we can hopefully change patients and families' lives. Nice. And I want to get to what Taish is doing in a yep. second, but first I want to talk to Casey. Um, I want to talk about the impact on, on patients. You know, what's at stake if you're a parent with a child with, uh, if you're a parent of a child with a rare disease? We'd love to hear your family story and tell it, tell us what it means to have hope that a gene therapy will be developed. Right. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, our journey began seven years ago when my son was diagnosed with a rare uh, neurodegenerative disease called um, Lee syndrome, and the specific gene is the SURF1 gene. Um, at the time, you know, and this was only seven years ago, uh, we were given no hope nothing, just take your child home. There's nothing you can do. Enjoy whatever time you have left and that's it. And my husband and I just didn't, that did not sit well with us. And um, so we decided to knock on every door and this is seven years ago. And we were being told at seven years, gene therapy is still to way far out. Don't even bother, don't worry about it. It's not even feasible at this time. And until we had this opportunity uh, two and a half years ago to fund preclinical work in gene therapy for our son's particular gene mutation. Um, and that has given us tremendous hope. 
and uh, we are in a race against time. And it, it's like with these progressive diseases, you know, every day you, you hear that clock getting louder and louder. So this just gives families like ours tons of hope. And we just couldn't even, this is breakthrough technology. We are super excited. Nice. Well, this is a good intro or segue to you, RA. Tell us a bit about the idea behind Tasha. How did you choose which conditions to focus on and what makes your approach so unique? No, I appreciate it. And thank you for having us on the panel today. Tasha was a really interesting collaboration that came out of uh, the UT Southwestern Medical Center Gene Therapy Group, which is led by Dr. Stephen Gray and Burge Manassian. And what's interesting about their approach, similar to what Suku mentioned, they, they were using validated technology, meaning technology that had been proven effective and safe uh, in a clinical setting and basically taking that technology and that experience and applying it at scale to a number of diseases where they had similar type of phenotype or similar type of issues, meaning monogenic diseases of the, of the CNS that could be potentially addressable by, by this technology. And so in doing that, they actually initiated work on a number of different programs uh, across three what, what you would consider three therapeutic areas, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, genetic forms of epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disorders and a number of indications in between each one of those therapeutic areas. Why central nervous? Because um, this is where gene therapy has been proven to be safe and effective and really leaning on the experience of, um, of what we've seen with Zolgensman and that great, um, and that great translational uh, success. And I was fortunate to be a part of, of, of that team. I was part of the management team uh, at Avexis with Suku and a number of the other members that joined us on this new journey here at Tasha. But this is where we saw the technology work in our own hands. And when you see it work in your own hands, you, it's not hard to believe. And so mm -hmm. when UT Southwestern was applying this technology, we had this great aha moment. They essentially were running a fully integrated pharmaceutical or biotech company within an ac a research academic setting for four years, essentially integrating um, target identification, construct design, translational development, and clinical care, as long, uh, along with GMP manufacturing capabilities, all under, a, all under an academic umbrella. And really where we came in is where we applied some of that industry expertise in order to get these programs from the early translational setting into the clinic and ultimately approved to get out to the broader market so that that therapeutic benefit could be achieved in the general population versus, versus in only the clinical uh, population. And so that's really where we brought our expertise. And, and along with that came some considerable funding. You mentioned the IPO. We're fortunate that uh, the company was one of the fastest seed to IPOs in biotech history, which we executed on last year. We were fortunate to raise approximately 307 million, uh, of which about 181 million um, were, were from the, the IPO in total of last year. And what that really did, it, it allowed us to bring on the necessary personnel and resources in order to basically pour rocket fuel on what the team over at UT Southwestern is doing in order to really apply broadly to these programs. We're now partnering with UT Southwestern on 25 different programs, all yeah. focused on monogenic diseases of the CNS. About 90% of them are focused on pediatric indications, including um, Casey's son, his, uh, her son's uh, indication, SERF1 deficiency, which we're excited that that'll be wow. in uh, the clinical setting later this year. So, so we're really excited to take some of that work that were pioneered really by a relentless parent that wouldn't give up on their child, take that, fun, take essentially what they did as a foundation um, and, and apply speed and scale to it and eventually get it into the clinic and hopefully uh, approve. Nice, let me stop you there because that's a perfect uh, segue to Casey. Mm -hmm. So I've covered rare diseases a bit and especially the growth of whole genome sequencing for sick kids. And as you can imagine, the stories of these families are gut-wrenching. First, they have to figure out what genetic condition their child suffers from. There have been incredible stories of parents finding other parents, starting foundations and getting research attention. How do you counsel patients about how they can advocate for their kids? And for example, try to get in the pipeline. That's a great question. 
Uh, for us, it was connecting with other like-minded um, families who also had the same rare disease as, as us and form a foundation and go directly to the research institutions and ask them specifically, what can we do to help move this uh, preclinical work research along, whether that's funding, what can we do to make things move faster? And so that's what we did in our instance. And uh, we were lucky enough to partner with UT Southwestern and, uh, and get this done. But I would, you know, it, it's imperative that you find a foundation. If, you're, if your disease already has a foundation, reach out to that foundation and see what research is going on in, in your particular disease. If there's nothing going on, then you have to make the waves and you get it done. Whether that's research, get on Google, start researching who's, who's covering this specific disease and ask, reach out, ask questions and see what you can do to help move the, move the needle faster. All right, that's great advice. So Laura, we know of the need for these therapies. And I understand that gene therapy is an unusual space because a lot of the innovation happens at the academic level. So what's the commercial landscape like? Are companies only attracted to commercialized gene therapies that they can expect big payouts? And how do we incentivize more companies to join in? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And, um, you know, f first is, is true, there is a lot of innovation happening in, in uh, academia. And it's so important for us, you know, in the industrial sector to really have these early collaborations and really understand where the technology is moving to. And is, you know, using the right tool for the right job. Uh, and I think that's, you know, really important. And we can talk some more about, you know, why some of the choices that Tasha is making make sense. Um, it's, um, so, you know, these, these really good interaction, getting this tool in the toolbox, uh, best tool for the particular disease, and understanding how to deploy them, how to make them in a consistent manner, so you have the best quality of that drug product to the patient. Um, you know, from the commercial point of view, it's, um, it depends on the company, right? So there are companies that are more gearing towards the ultra rare and where that is, you know, fits their, you know, corporate strategy. Um, you know, I think that it's going to be, there are some monogenic diseases as Suko was talking about that, you know, have a large number of patients that, you know, are attractive to, to many of us. You know, and here I'm talking about the hemophilias, for example, or, you know, some of the lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, but then as we begin to understand and demonstrate efficacy, it really opens the door to using solutions that have been proven to be safe and effective in really smaller populations. Um, what is the appeal of an ultra rare disease for a company? Um, and maybe I'll let Array talk about yeah, that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the appeal really is, at least for us, is the development pathway is a lot, typically a lot yeah. shorter than what it would be when you would go after a larger disease. So as Suku mentioned, um, you know, you think of diabetes. Well, to conduct a diabetes development program, it, it could take you years because obviously there's a lot of patients, it impacts a lot of people. Um, and the and the bar is a lot higher because the FDA and the regulatory agencies really want to ensure that any program that gets through the door is safe and effective. But once it gets there, obviously there's a big there's a big commercial opportunity at the end of the day. But from a rare disease perspective, if you're able to prove that a, that a uh, program or a development the drug development program is safe and effective early where there's not many patients out there that you could actually do in a clinical assessment. What is the definition of ultra rare? So I think different people have different definitions. Uh, in the United States, an orphan drug is, is defined as a disease that affects uh, less than 200,000 patients, right? But that's a pretty big population. I would probably say when you start to get down to what's considered ultra rare, you're probably talking about patient populations that are probably less than about 10,000. But you okay. can even get smaller. So in the, in the case of SERF1 deficiency, we're talking about somewhere between probably 500 patients uh, in the US and Europe. So it's, it's, it's fairly small. 
But then you, that also, you could also think about a disease like Rett syndrome, for example, which is another program we're going after. That's still considered relatively ultra rare, but we're talking about a patient population that's about 25,000 to 30,000 patients, right? And so it, it, it's a lot of nuance in that word, but, but uh, that's how we would break it down from an industry standpoint. But what, and I think Laura was mentioning, it, uh, mentioning this, what really helps us go and be able to treat some of the ultra rare populations is the validation in the larger population setting because that's what attracts all the investment. So Rett syndrome, um, hemophilia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this is where all the investment goes. And, and SMA, this is where all the investment goes because this is where a lot of the commercial opportunity lies. But once you validate a technology in those larger populations, you can then start to move down and start treating some of the populations because you're not recreating the wheel. So take, for example, the, the, the capsid or the virus that we use, AV9, where Suku already validated AV9 in, in spinal muscular atrophy, which is a, a monogenic pediatric CNS disease. So I don't have to go revalidate that technology in SERP1, it's already been done. He already validated the route of administration, both intravenously and interthecally. Well, I don't have to do that. I could, I, you know, I, I, I could take that technology and apply it to SERP1. Same thing for manufacturing. He validated mammalian manufacturing as a viable, uh, scalable commercial manufacturing platform. Well, I don't have to do that. I basically take that learning and apply it to um, SERP1. So basically, Standing on Zolgensma and Suku and the rest of the team's shoulders uh, that, that went through that process at Avexis, we're four or five years ahead of the game because we're standing on that validated technology. So really the level of investment I have to make is a lot less than what Suku and our, and our former team at Avexis had to make in order to validate that technology from the start. So I'm, started, I'm starting, you know, let's say 50, year, I mean 50 yards down you know, at, um, on a football field, I only have 50 yards to go because he ran the first 50 yards for me. That is very well put. Is that sort of the whole idea of this push to, I've, I've heard the phrase rare as many of, mm -hmm. you know, keeping people interested yes. and showing like why these are very important, you know, endeavors and how it benefits everyone, which of uh, course you, it does. That's exactly right. You prove the model once and okay. And, and you're able to then apply it to, to multiple programs. Suku and, and, and his new company, Jaguar, it's a similar approach. We're using the same technology because it's been validated. And Suku, I don't want to speak for you, so yeah, maybe you Yeah, want Suku, to what are you doing at Jaguar? <laughs> Tell us. So thanks, Ari, for that uh, compliment. I don't deserve that much credit because even though <laughs> it was a real team effort. So at Jaguar Gene Therapy, as Ari pointed out, we are using the AAV9 platform. And that serotype within the AAV serotypes is thought to be the best when it comes to biodistribution in the central nervous system, whether given intravenously or intrathecally. And we are focusing on multiple different diverse disease states at Jaguar Gene Therapy, one of them being autism spectrum disorder, huh. which as you know, uh, there is significant unmet medical need. Uh, and we're going to use the ICV or intracerebroventricular approach. We are also going to evaluate galactosemia where newborn screening already exists, but it's a terrible disease where there's an acute and a chronic phase where these children develop central nervous system disorders, which include cognitive dysfunction, speech pathology, uh, all sorts of liver uh, dysfunction. They form cataracts very early in life and so forth. So we think with newborn screening, we can treat intravenously very early and have hopefully significant impact on the disease course. We are also uh, evaluating type one diabetes uh, which is near and dear to my heart, given that's my core background from the past. And we are evaluating uh, uh, what I consider transformative gene therapy, where we are going to uh, convert alpha cells in the pancreas into beta cells and restore insulin secretory function. And we think that holds significant potential in the future, as long as we can prove it in the uh, humans when you go into first in human trials. And then finally, we have a program in celiopathy is called Bade Beetle syndrome, which by the way is an ultra rare disease but there's a significant unmet medical need there as well, given that all these children eventually go legally blind before the age of 20, and they have significant obesity and insulin resistance, which results in sudden cardiac death, the need for renal transplants, et cetera. So as I said, uh, lots of different disease states, but the common root here, as RA emphasized, is the AAV9 platform. And the team 
is very experienced. Many of these folks are from Avexis, uh, where we established the manufacturing platform and capabilities, uh, uh, really laid the coursework essentially to work with the regulators, including the FDA, to set the standards for how you evaluate a transformative gene therapy, comparing it to natural history, et cetera, where I would venture to say even biostats doesn't matter if you have that kind of transformative impact on the actual evaluation. Of well, that's, that's a good lead into my next question. So obviously we cannot have this panel and not talk about the cost of some of these therapies. Suku, so how much does Zolgen, I can never say that, Zolgensima cost? So Zolgensima is a one-time therapy. Mm -hmm. So you give it intravenously one time and it's at the present time, Novartis charges, I think 2.1 million mm -hmm. for this therapy. Now I would put this in some context because a human life is thought right, to be- You can't worth, put a dollar right? limit on that. Yeah, right. 8.5, 8.6 million based on the NIH evaluation and FDA. And the other therapies available for SMA, especially SMA type one over a five year period, which includes supportive care costs over $10 million. So in a way, when you do uh, the, you know, what they, what they call market access reimbursement and clinical value evaluations, or it's called clinical effectiveness. Uh, many feel that the $2.1 million is more than appropriate given the cost of the development programs and the cost that it takes and the investment it takes to actually manufacture these products. How have you been, have you had issues convincing insurance companies or is that still a challenge? I, I know you're not still with that company. Yes, yeah, so I'm not with uh, Novartis, yeah. so I would not comment, but when I was there, given that it is a rare disease and less than 500 patients in the US, most insurance companies would have two or three children that they had to cover and they would not push back as long as they mm. felt that the therapy and the age group chosen was appropriate and it would change the patient or the children's lives and the family's lives. Nice. Um, all right, how does Tasha mm. plan to address the cost issue? You know, I, I think again, it's a, it would be a similar approach. I, I was fortunate to be a part of the, the, the team, as I mentioned, at, at Avexis. So in some ways we were kind of flying the plane and building it at, at the same time. This was the first time this, this question ever had to be answered about a one-time therapy, a, a one-time therapy. What do you charge for a one-time therapy? To, to the point of kind of what Suku said, we, we always used to stop short of saying the word cure. But to be quite honest, if you saw uh, a patient that should have succumbed to disease early on and to now see that patient running around, swimming, jumping, climbing trees, it, it, I don't know what else you would call it, right? And so it's quite hard to kind of put a, a, a dollar amount on, on, what, on what that is. So what I would say for, for Tasha, we're quite some ways away from that. And so we don't have to necessarily answer that question today. I think what we're trying to do is to really prove out if these programs are safe and effective, if, if these uh, therapies are safe and effective in the clinic and actually have that transformational effect that we saw with our experience uh, in developing uh, Zolgensma. Back when, when Suku and I were working on it, it was called AVXS 101. So that tells you, you know, <laughs> that was quite some time ago, but, but really, I think that's really where we're focused on is kind of the first stage of development, just proving that these that these programs can work in children. Nice. Laura, this one's for you. Of course, we're talking about the success stories, mm -hmm. but how do you how do we move forward while staying mindful of the risk? And I'd like to talk about, you know, some of the recent stories we've heard about Bluebird and, you know, some of the cancer cases. Do you do you, what questions should we be asking the FDA moving forward? And are we being too cautious or not enough? Yeah. So, you know, it's always a, a question of um, benefit and risk, right? So it needs to be evaluated for the particular disease, right? So, you know, as we were talking about uh, SMA1, uh, those children die within a year of age, right? So there you can take a lot more risk for that disease. Um, as you go to more general um, diseases in which you can apply a genetic approach, and you know we could talk about cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. and there, for example, it would need to be a very safe um, drug, right? The risk is is minimal, so you know that's the first consideration, right? What where are you deploying um, the the drug, and you know what's uh, what are you planning to to do in that patient? How are you going to change their life? 
Second is understanding how to use the right tool for the right job. So, you know, one of, not only is the delivery vehicle, right? Where are you delivering the gene therapy, you know, construct, uh, the intended target cells, as well as other target cells? And if you do that, are there any consequences of that? Uh, and related to that is, can you regulate the expression of that transgene that you're incorporating? So uh, you don't go too high that it could be um, toxic, for example. Uh, and overexpression can lead to, to, to toxicity and you know, cause, cause a problem. So for example, incorporating either uh, regulatory sequences in the construct that allows you to titrate or prevent this overexpression are safety uh, solutions that are being incorporated. And Ira can tell you more about how that's been incorporated into, into his pipeline. Um, so, you know, and the other is we've seen uh, for AAV, uh, particularly systemic, that, you know, high doses of AAV could lead to toxicity. So where the field is going is understanding um, the source. And when you say toxicity, what do you mean by that? Like, how does that manifest? So they, they could be an immune response uh, systemic uh, against the, the virus at the end of the day is a virus that, you know, is going to be now, you know, in, in your tissues, right? So uh, the immune system uh, will react and that, for example, can result in, a, in having a, a type of liver inflammation, an in immune mediated hepatitis or um, at high doses, you could see inflammation of the heart, of the cardiac muscle and other muscles, right? So the question is, you know, what is the proper dose that keeps you within the safety window that, you know, is necessary to keep the patient safe and also achieving full uh, efficacy? So, you know, for, for this, um, you know, this therapeutic window, right? And this effectiveness, uh, there are new capsets that are being developed, but also uh, understanding how to pre-treat and co-treat the patients with uh, other therapies that will minimize, for example, an immune response. And that has proven to work really, really well in mitigating these inflammatory responses mm -hmm. and allowing for, um, you know, less damage and for the AAV gene therapy to be expressed longer. And the last thing is, you know, you know, for certain indications, you don't need to give a systemic administration. Mm -hmm. You could give a local administration that, you know, is going to go directly to where it needs to go, uh, minimizing a more systemic uh, risk. And that's similar, you know, just to kind of piggyback on what Laura was saying, this is similar to kind of the, the, the approach that we're trying to apply to, to our portfolio. But again, using, using the notion of the right tools for, for, the, for the right job and, to, and trying to balance that, that risk and benefit and, and, and ultimately uh, minim, minimize the uh, risk to patients. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We're delivering our drug interthecally directly to the cerebral spinal fluid because that's essentially where the disease manifests itself holistically throughout the central nervous system. And that's the way that you impact the central nervous system. And it really is a way to try to avoid any type of systemic exposure that could overall result in increased inflammation or immunogenicity that, that, that Laura just mentioned. But what it also does is it improves the probability that you'll hit the cell type that you ultimately want to affect. What our word, you know, lack of better words, we say transduce, but really it's the cell type that the virus infects in order to release the DNA, which is the normal copy of a gene. And so really this is the, the most direct way um, and in some cases the most effective way, but not always this is the case in every disease. You know, in some diseases you need to get widespread uh, exposure to the, th to the therapy in order to improve all aspects of the disease. And so in those cases, you do have to deliver IV, but it's really about the right tools for the right, for the right job, meaning the right, you know, uh, the right payload, the right construct, the right route of administration, the right immunosuppression regimen for any particular disease. And you may need to switch that 
depending on the disease state. And so, but today we have a number of tools that are available to us that we didn't have in the past. And so that's really the, 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 the fortunate thing. We have ways of uh, controlling gene expression if we're, if we're worried about overexpression, which can sometimes uh, result in toxicity. So we have ways of controlling that expression today. Um, we have ways of actually addressing a monogenic disease where the gene is too big to fit inside a conventional AAV, but we have ways around it. Laura and her company, they're doing gene editing and in, in, in Tasha's and um, in, 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 in the technology we're using is mini genes or we're vectorizing RNA technology to, to, to approach diseases where the gene may be too big um, to fit inside uh, AAV to just do gene replacement. So again, we have a number of tools at our disposal to, to really open up the opportunity of, of indication that we can go after. Nice. What is the timeline? I know we're all used to like having a vaccine in a year. So it's like now we have to go back to normal life, but what is the, how long does it take? Well, I think, you, get a therapy? I think you could look at Casey and the work that her, her uh, patient organization did. You, uh, Casey, you guys found Steve in two years and we hope to be in the clinic this year. That's unheard of in, wow. in drug development. Typically the timeline to get a drug developed um, in a small molecule case would be 10 years or more. And the fact of the matter is in two years, we've been able to build a therapy, test it preclinically, get a level of comfort that it's safe and effective and to now move it into the clinic. Um, that, you know, you, you don't get faster than that. Which we are so thankful for. I mean, like we, like I said in the beginning, you know, we are in a race against time and every day matters in these children's lives. So. Suki, what would you tell other people interested in, you know, going into this field about the challenges companies face now and how they've changed? I am actually very optimistic. So uh, I, I wouldn't even say, uh, in the sense that uh, what, what we've seen repeatedly now is that with gene therapy, if you have the right animal models, and if you see um, uh, transformative impact even in the animal model, it tends to translate into the human as long as your clinical trial designs and your patient selection is appropriate. The, some of the observations around um, you know, the immune response, uh, there's been a lot of study around how you can mute that immune response by using different methods which I think will make gene therapies uh, where the benefit will far outweigh the risk in the future. As far as route of administration goes, I think we've become very creative as, uh, as academic uh, institutions, as well as uh, uh, sponsors like ourselves, where we now tailor the route of administration to optimize the impact of that gene therapy for a specific disease. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what I would also say is it's not just simple vector-based gene therapy. As Laura knows, there's gene editing, there's alternative ways to use non-viral particles to deliver uh, you know, the gene of interest. There's also other technologies which look at very targeted uh, editing. There's mRNA technologies. And I was actually uh, uh, smiling when you talked about vaccines being developed this mm -hmm. quickly. Absolutely, I've never seen vaccines develop this quickly, and I never thought I would ever see it. Mm -hmm. The only caveat, though, is vaccines in general have to be given on a repeat basis. Mm -hmm. My hope is with gene therapy, we don't have to do mm -hmm. that. So yeah. that is where all the work I think we are collectively doing, hopefully will ease the burden of disease for many of the patients and families and allow us to give them a one-time treatment, whatever the route of administration, to essentially manage the progression of the disease or well, RA, I'll say it, hopefully cure the diseases as well. Yeah. <laughs> Are there times it doesn't work or is it? I'm sorry, Sarah? Is it times like it doesn't work or I mean, what are the success rates of, of the one-time therapy? Is it? So the general rule of thumb in gene therapy, especially the therapies we are working on where it's a vector-based delivery system, the earlier you treat, the better. better. Mm -hmm. So if you can identify patients in a pre-symptomatic stage before they actually get symptoms and treat, then I think your clinical impact is far greater. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat is the way uh, most countries, including the U.S., approve newborn screening for diseases. Usually you have to have a therapeutic intervention to get newborn screening approved at a state level and a federal level. And if there's one thing I'd love to see change is turn that 
uh, actual policy upside down on its head. I think we need to really push very hard to have newborn screening for many of these rare and ultra rare diseases such that we can start developing therapeutic interventions and management supportive yeah. techniques very early. So that to me is, I think, a, a drive many of us who are in the industry have talked about with academic institutions as well. Nice. Laura, I see you shaking your head. You have some, I think you want to jump in. You know, no, the, what he's saying is absolutely right, right? So you were asking, when doesn't it work? And, and sometimes it's because it's too late, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is damage that has accumulated. And if you had been able to intervene really early, it, you know, it would be reversible, right? So for many of the degenerative disease, you know, some of them will not be reversible. So early diagnosis and, you know, the patient journey, right? That you know, for many of them, it's a nightmare. It's years of, you know, confusion and, you know, uh, so finding ways of, you know, early uh, detection of screening, because once that we figure out, you know, what we were saying before, right, that the tool works for a particular organ, right, then, you know, the drug is, it's coded by the DNA. So we already okay. know what we need to do. It's very different from small molecules, right, where you need to screen and you take years, mm -hmm. you know, to do it. Here, you just enter it on the computer. You know what it is, and you just make it. So um, yeah. that's, you know, for me, that's what makes being in this field so exciting. Yeah, and I All think right. that's the interesting thing about the team at UT Southwestern, where UT Southwestern was, in its history, it was very much focused on basic research, basic science, just kind of understanding biology at the basic level but not necessarily translating that bio biology and affecting human disease. And with, you know, with kind of this recent, um, with, this, with this recent understanding and success of gene therapy, you've seen the number of, of translational scientists at UT Southwestern that become on, entrepreneurs or at least um, significantly associated with the company. It, it's, it's just in, increased exponenti exponentially. Just recently in the last three years, you've just had a number of successes, not only Tasha but also Recode Therapeutics, which is actually where I met Laura where, as she was assessing some technology around a, a delivery system, a lipid nanoparticle delivery system to treat genetic disease. And, and, and I happened to sit on the board of that company. And, and um, it, it just, just the promise that that type of technology holds. Also, you know, a gene editing, company that Laura also assessed during her former life uh, focused on DMD and gene editing of DMD um, came out of UT Southwestern recently and sold to a large biotech uh, company and really just the speed of innovation and kind of just that that what I would say pivot from and they still do a great job on the basic research side but really trying to affect human disease and I think you with these catalysts the parents have really provided and, and funding that that's come along with their great work they really help move the academics to more of how do we apply this to, to, to humans today? And really that's where the speed comes in. And so honestly, I think the, the future looks extremely bright of what we're able to do um, and how we could apply these innovations quickly from academia and move them into the clinic and then in the commercial setting. Nice. So we have about a minute um, left for each person. Um, Laura Suku and Casey, if you want to talk about, you know, what would you like to see in the next five years? Where would you like to see this field go? So maybe I'll start. Um, we okay. need to have, you know, different modalities being deployed to uh, provide a real, you know, long lasting cures to patients. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Ira and Suku talk about what I'm doing, which is, you know, a different type of genetic manipul manipulation called uh, CRISPR gene editing. Mm -hmm. You know, and there is a, a, a place for each of these technologies to be deployed and be transformational for patients. So I'm looking for all of us to be moving to the clinic and, you know, really realizing this promise. Nice. Suku? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, my uh, hope uh, is, is very simple and straightforward. I, I sincerely hope that many of us who are working in this field continue to work very closely with academic institutions where the very early work is being done that I think is life-changing. And then we work together with them to do the translational work and eventually bring it to patients because academic centers do good science, but uh, they need our help and we need their help to bring it to patients. 
and patients are what eventually matter, right? So given that we know many of the rare and ultra rare diseases and we do know uh, the genetic basis for many of them, I'm just hoping that there will be many others like us who will be pioneers and develop uh, novel gene therapies regardless of the delivery systems and actually help cure these diseases. Nice. And Casey, I'll let you have the last word. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that no child has to go through losing abilities like walking, talking, eating. And when a parent does get the diagnosis uh, of a terminally ill rare disease, a doctor can say, wait a minute, we do have a treatment for that. There's no need to suffer. That's what I want. And that's what needs to be done for these children because nobody should suffer like they have. Well, thank you all for joining us. I keep up your good work. This is exciting to see and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. This is really